Heat always flows from hot to cold because, well, because it's more likely. And that's wildly unsatisfying and perhaps confusing. But hopefully, I can clear some of that up. First, I should explain what makes something hot in the first place. If you have a lump of metal, we say that it's hot if the atoms making it up are, on average, moving a lot. Similarly, it's cold if the atoms aren't moving much. Now there's a lot of atoms in any given lump of matter, and it's all jiggling and jostling all the time. So at any moment in time, some atoms might be moving a lot, and some might be moving only a little, but the temperature of the thing only cares about average motion. Now let's compare two things that are otherwise identical except their temperatures. For any given atom, the range of possible motion in a higher temperature one is larger, because the maximum speed is higher. And that means the number of possible ways the hotter thing can be arranged at any given moment is bigger, because each constituent atom has a larger range of motion. We say that each way the object can be at any given temperature is a microstate. So that means that, all else being equal, things that are hotter have more microstates. Now you might be asking, what does any of this have to do with temperature? Well, let's count the number of digits in the number of microstates. So if there's 10, then you have two digits, if there's 100 microstates, then you have three digits, and so on. It turns out that the temperature of an object is inversely proportional to the number of digits gained per unit of energy added. Put another way, cold things gain and lose microstates a lot easier than hot things do. By the way, the number of digits in the number of microstates is a measure of entropy. Now that's all fine and dandy, but I should explain what this has to do with heat flow. When you put a hot thing in contact with a cold thing, the atoms all start jiggling around, bumping into each other, and so on. Now, because it's pretty much random, the microstate that it ends up landing in is essentially picked from all of the possible microstates. So all we have to do is figure out which configuration has the most microstates, as that will be the most likely. So there's two possible options. The first option is when the hotter thing gets energy and the colder thing loses energy. In this case, the temperature of the hot thing increases by, say, one unit, while the temperature of the colder thing decreases by the same unit. But from what we know about microstates, that means that while the cold thing loses a lot of microstates, the hot thing only gains a few. So overall, this end result has much fewer available microstates than the combined system started with. On the other hand, if the cold thing gets energy from the hot thing, then it will gain lots of microstates while the hot thing only loses a few. This means that there's a lot more ways to store the energy in microstates where the cold thing gets hotter and the hot thing gets colder. So if you just picked a distribution of energy at random from all of the available configurations, you'll find that the vast, vast majority of the time you'll land on one where the hot thing gave energy to the cold thing. So it's a game of probability. There's not some force of nature forcing heat to flow from hot to cold. That's just the most likely outcome, and it's so overwhelmingly more likely we call it a law, the second law of thermodynamics.